All right, episode three, Ask Coach Nate. Uh, we're gonna focus on how to stay warm in the winter while cycling. So winter, winter's here, even in Northern California, the mornings can be pretty cold. I thought I'd ask Nate to give us some tips about how he, can, how he stays warm during cycling and what you can do to stay warm when you're, you're cycling uh, this winter. In fact, I brought some of my favorite pairs of gloves to, to show off because I find that my hands are typically what's cold when uh, cycling in those early mornings in, uh, in Northern California. So, so Nate, I know you told me a story about how you wore <laughs> like scuba gear. Did you wear the snorkel to stay warm when you were training as a pro doing five hour rides in the, in the middle of the winter is tell us about uh, what you were doing to, to stay warm. <laughs> well, before we started filming, I was sharing with Gregory the most outlandish apparel choices that I've ever made as a cyclist. So, Nowadays, most of the time in the winter, it's not that rainy in the Bay. I mean, it rains and sometimes it's cold and sometimes it's raining quite heavily, but usually it's like pretty timid in the winter here. And I feel so soft when I'm like thinking to myself, oh, it looks miserable outside. Because I used to ride like four or five hours, sometimes six hours, like no matter what the weather was. Like on my days off from work, I would just get the training in because that's what I needed to do. But a couple of years, it was just raining a lot and I was so... Um, anxious to get good training in and not feel miserable while doing it. So I bought neoprene socks and neoprene pants that are designed for snorkeling and would wear that if it was 50 degrees or less and it was going to be raining the whole time that I was out. So if it was over 50 or 55, like I would just overheat and I would just wear like leg warmers or, or nothing and just deal with the fact that I was wet. But if it was like, it was 40 degrees and raining and just miserable and it was like hailing, that was actually a great setup. I would have my shorts on, I would have neoprene socks and pants on over my shorts, my regular like bib shorts. And then I would have like, you know, some, some layers and a rain jacket up top and some neoprene gloves. But I definitely remember like riding like up along Skyline, down Redwood, over Pinehurst and like going through Canyon and like out to Moraga. And it was like 40 degrees, maybe less and like hailing hard where like you couldn't even see the center line in the road, like going over the bump into Moraga. But I was so comfortable, like my legs were warm and it like hurt my face, but the rest of my body was fine. Cause like between my cap and like my uh, neck being covered, like my face would get pelted with uh, hail, which was kind of stinging, <laughs> but I, I felt pretty good actually. And I was really happy that I'd figured out how to deal with 40 degree rain and still get good training in. Cause it's like, if it's really cold out and it's raining, like you can get the miles in sometimes, but if your legs are physically cold, it's just hard to do quality training. Like even if you're just trying to ride like tempo or like low threshold on the climbs, like your enzymes just don't work as well when they're cold. Like they work best when they're like 98 to hundred degrees Fahrenheit. And so if it's like 40 degrees and raining, like you're, you're just limited in what you can do. So I, I was looking for all opportunities that I could to make good training. <laughs> Did you wear the snorkeling gear over your cycling shorts? Yeah, because okay. I wanted the pad on, you know, like, so um, my skin was handling the situation well, um, and I would just wear the, the, the snorkeling pants over my, over my bibs. So yeah, I've never heard the snorkeling gear hack, <laughs> but uh, was, I like it. I think it's a good idea. It didn't flap and it wasn't like, $300 like a pair of nice Gore-Tex pants would be and like even if I got something like that I hate stuff that flaps and is noisy and feels slow like obviously you can do good training if you're riding slow but it just feels lousy if you're going like 15 miles an hour when you're used to going like 18 or 20 you know anyway that's just that's just me <laughs> yeah I never I never did the snorkeling gear and I never did the tin foil around the the toes too which I have heard and uh, have seen other people do I just would get more clothes sometimes, like a bunch of sweatshirts and bring jackets and things on really cold rides. I used to like to do the Mount Diablo Summit ride on New Year's Day. Yeah. And that descent is like, you need a, a down jacket. You need Everest level equipment to do, to do that. I haven't done it in years because it was so cold doing that, that descent. Um, you know, for me, like, it's just my hands get cold. That's why I brought all my, all my gloves. I have so many gloves. Like I have uh, rather thin gloves here that uh, you can um, you can put on, and they have they have like your standard glove system, but then they've got the cover, right? I like these. 
I've gotten lots of lots of these types of types of gloves because they have multiple options, right? So put this for when I'm descending, and then I'll take it off, you know, as I'm climbing because you'll get you'll get warm as you're going up up the hill. And then yeah, of so course, you have, like, you have multiple sets of gloves for like yeah. 50 degrees and 40 degrees and like 30 or less, which is how cold it gets sometimes, like overnight and early morning. I got the, uh, here. Let me see. This is the um the lobster claw one right so this like i don't need this often but i do use it in the early morning i was riding across marin to san francisco in the early mornings like 5 a.m and like that was was really cold so the problem is like if i get up really early and i'll got the lobster gloves i need to bring a different pair of gloves with me for later on in the ride so that's typically what i do yeah for, uh, for winter riding yeah yeah so i i feel like that brings up kind of like a key topic that a lot of newer riders maybe aren't uh as familiar with i feel like in just everyday apparel it's like if it's cold out you can just wear a heavier jacket if it's not as cold out you wear like a lighter jacket cycling though it's like there's so much difference in how much wind chill you get because you're going uphill at like eight or ten miles an hour you're going downhill at 40 miles an hour and maybe you're descending into like a microclimate that's 10 degrees cooler than it was on the other side. So maybe it's like 30 degrees where 15 minutes ago, 20 minutes ago, it was like 40 or 45 degrees. So I feel like layering is like one of the key things that any new cyclist needs to wrap their head around. It's like way better to have five thin layers that you can modulate than to have just like two layers and no ability to modulate your, your insulation and temperature, at least in like more challenging conditions. Like if it's just, I don't know, if it's all warmer weather, maybe you don't need anything complicated, but if it's like humid and maybe it's gonna rain and maybe it's gonna be 30 degrees some of the ride and 50 degrees some of the ride, it's really a key to have multiple layers. So what's, what's like the key rundown of like, if you were gonna have like the core essential apparel for somebody that's not riding just indoors or in summer weather what would you what would your closet look like because I feel like this is really useful I feel like a lot of beginning riders I remember when I was getting into riding like I kind of slowly but surely built up my collection of clothing and um, was like learning how to deal with different weather and I feel like it would have it's, it's, it's helpful to know kind of like what um, to shoot for if you're trying to figure out how to dress in all different conditions that you might be faced with when you're riding yeah I, for me you know doing so many early morning rides where it's really cold. I've gotten pretty good at gauging the temperature and knowing what, what uh, clothing to wear. So between like 50 and 55, I'll definitely wear uh, leg warmers, arm warmers, and long finger finger gloves, but like a thinner glove than what I showed. Below probably 50, a couple layers up top. Yeah, like a base layer, a jersey, uh, and maybe No, I just vest. wear a jersey. Okay. Um, I guess like my core is usually pretty warm, like over over 50. Um, it depends like on winter, summer. So even if it's uh, like 50 to 55 yeah. in summer in San Francisco or in, in uh, the Bay Area, uh, I don't need a, a vest. But in the winter, like when I went out yesterday and it was like over 50, maybe 55, yeah. I need the vest because the, uh, the wind is so cold. Um, just the, the air or there's something different, like the air is colder. Um, yeah. And then below 50 where I'll need, you know, warmer gear, shoe covers for sure, at least toe covers. I use that. And then I have the, um, the full winter uh, shoe cover on a different pair of shoes. I just, I just leave them on and I just use those shoes. Yeah. Cold. Yeah. I, I feel like I love base layers. Whenever it's less than 60 degrees, I'll often have a base layer and arm warmers as an option. If it's 55 or less, I love vests because they're light and you can unzip them, but you can zip it back up when you're descending, but it's not like you're carrying a lot of extra weight and your arms aren't flapping and like slowing you down and like being noisy. Um, and if it gets warm enough, you can even take it off if it's, if it's like a thin windbreaker type vest and like fold it up and put it nicely in your rear pocket if it's like 40 when you start and 60 when you finish later in the ride. I feel like personally, Toe covers have never worked that great for me because I feel like if my ankle and like lower leg are cold, like my toes are maybe what hurt, but having toe covers doesn't for me help a ton. Same with my hands. Um, so like I just have full shoe covers. Like if it's cold enough, I'll just have a full shoe cover on and I'd rather be like a little bit warm than have painful toes. Likewise up top, like sometimes um, warm gloves are great but if my arms are cold because i just have arm warmers on over the years i figured out that 
if my arms are cold, my hands will be cold no matter what gloves I have on. So a lot of times now I'll kind of overshoot what I think that I need on my arms. So I'll maybe have like arm warmers and then like a windbreaker or some sort of a thin insulated jacket over that if it's like 40 or 45 because you know I have some good gloves that are different thicknesses like you but if it's really cold um, I, I need that extra insulation for my arms and then of course rain jackets are key if it's going to rain what's yep. your favorite selection for when it's raining and and even rain, uh, I hailing do not, don't I don't like to ride in the rain I'll typically go ride indoors do peloton or go to the go to the gym it was popular for a while that we would all go and do spin class yeah. together in the bicycle club and people that I I ride with and we would do like three four hours uh indoors do like multiple classes yeah people thought we were crazy we literally had domestiques that would go and get all the water bottles for everybody and then hand them out like we were uh like we were racing it was um it was fun I actually really enjoyed those times yeah I don't like to ride in the rain very much if I get caught in the rain like I'll just kind of like deal with it and be miserable and then it gets my bike really dirty too which I, I don't like at all yeah I feel like now it's much easier with like Zwift or with Peloton and smart trainers generally to get a lot more out of indoor training and to have the time pass more easily so I feel like that is a nice opportunity that exists now that didn't 10 years ago for a lot of people that like don't want to go riding in the rain and it's like if you're going to spend you know hundreds or even a thousand bucks on like a complete wardrobe of like crazy cold weather and rain weather gear like you could just get a smart trainer and train indoors um so i feel like if you're not doing those like five hour rides through the colorado snow or like up diablo in the middle of december like i used to do probably just having like a smart trainer and a good indoor setup could be good um but oh what was i thinking oh that also brings up the question about like equipment and dealing with shorter daylight hours and wetter roads. I feel like just you're mentioning about the rain. It reminds me there's so much extra crap on the road that your drivetrain gets dirtier, even if you're not riding in the rain, but just the roads are wet. Like your drive can, train gets dirtier, your brake pads are gonna wear out faster because they have, have a lot more debris on them. Your tires are gonna get cut up more because all the stuff like washes to the side of the road. And so a lot of people will get like tougher tires and they'll check their chain wear more frequently and their brake pad more frequently during the winter time. Um, and you, you do that, right? You have like a whole different set of wheels that you have lying around for the winter time, correct? Yeah, I got to switch them today. So I have a older set of uh, training wheels and I use the really thick um, tires. I think I have, I don't have armadillos. I have the- uh, Gator um, skins probably. Yeah, I have the gator skins, which work, they, they work great. Like. I was trying to ride around on racing tires last winter and I kept getting flats and it was driving me crazy. So um, I got the uh, gator skins on and that's been fantastic. The only problem is like the compound's really hard. So it makes it's me really strippy. nervous yeah. descending and I don't want to go through the turns too too quickly, but I'm trying to take all my descending easy these days anyway. So yeah, it's not a, it's not a huge problem. And it's fine. I mean, I feel like a lot of people like to descend and go hard through a turn sometimes because it's fun. It's like it's like go-kart racing or something. It's just fun to feel that way. But it's like nobody needs to be taking risks on their training rides. And when the conditions are good and you have good tires on and you know there's not like oil yeah. and water on the road and you know that the descent is not likely to have like gravel and dirt in the corners, like that can be fun. But everyone, I don't know, should just play it safe. And especially in the winter when the roads are wet, especially the first rains when the oil on the road kind of rinses off and it's like extra slippery, it's good to just play it safe. Um, I would say, yeah, so like, I think my favorite tires over the years would be, and, and like the ones that I think are most universally recommended, especially given some that I'm like somebody that has a lot of bike shop experience working there over the years, would be like the Armadillo tires from Specialized, the Gator skins from Continental, uh, and then I would offer also the Criterium Endurance from Kenda. That was like our bike, uh, our tire sponsor for a few years when I was racing. And like those tires were actually really good. Like they definitely weren't the grippiest, but they were great training tires. They're very durable and they had like a really tough belt just like the others. Um, so like any of those could be potentially good options if you're trying to minimize flats. And if you wanted an extra layer of protection against like punctures and like nails or staples giving you flats. Um, I will like starting probably five years ago, I just never ride without tubes with removable valve cores and a couple ounces of latex based tire sealant yeah. in my tires. And it's like, nothing is foolproof, 
but that really helps because if you get just like a small puncture, it almost always seals up in the same way that a tubeless setup would, but you don't have to go out and buy like 80 or $90 tubeless tires. And it's just easier from a maintenance standpoint to set up because um, you don't need to worry about like the tire seating. You can just run regular tires, regular tubes, but add a little bit of sealant. And I find that like, I'll get a few flats each year, but it's like, it's usually less than four or five, like all year, even, even in a high mileage year, it's not a lot. Um, so I've, I've been really happy with that kind of setup. It's just like good tires, making sure you replace them before they're totally blown. <laughs> and uh, likewise for chains and, and cassettes, like I, I definitely think that having a chain checker is like one of my key tools. And especially in the winter time when you just have so much more crap on your chain and it just wears out more quickly, checking your chain so you don't roast the rest of your drivetrain is really helpful. Um, I guess, I don't know, I'll, I'll probably make some maintenance videos about stuff like that as like a separate thing. But what else, what else were we going to cover today, Gregory? We yeah. wanted like clothing, a little bit on gear, and you mentioned lights too on the outline that you wanted to cover. So yes. what, what's your light setup? Yeah, that's, dude, so I've gone through lots of different light setups and I've tried all kinds of things. So for me, early morning riding, uh, where there's not a lot of uh, lighting around, you need like a 700 lumen light for your for the front, right? You need the one where people like hide their eyes because it's it's too strong. It's like a motorcycle light. That that that's what you need. If particularly if you're by yourself, if you're in a group ride with people in the morning, all the lights collectively together make a really big difference on lighting the way, so it's a lot safer. And you definitely need some kind of tail light. You can get multiple lights and like people put on the back of their helmet and all of that. I just have a tail light in the back of my bike, but I like the new Garmin tail light that has the radar detection. And then I get a readout on my bicycle computer and it actually tells me exactly how far away the car is behind me, which is really important information. And particularly if you're riding alone early in the morning in the dark, um, that's good to know. I prefer riding in the morning too in the dark because uh, I think most of the riders are up or had some coffee, they're alert, they're on the way to work. Like my experience has been pretty safe or in the evening, I, I'm not a fan of it at all. I think people are tired, they wanna get home they take yeah. risks and they're really annoyed by uh, cyclists who are taking over the road or trying to make left turns, things like that it can be really problematic. Yeah, totally. And I feel like lights, lights are crazy. Over the last 10 years, like every year or two, they get twice as bright and they last twice as long for the same price point. So I think a lot of times, like if people don't have really lights that they're really confident about, like just go out and check what is available now because it's, it's, pretty impressive what you can get for not that much. And I think the biggest thing is, yeah, like just make sure it's at least six or 700 lumens if you want to actually see with it and make sure it's going to last at least as long as you need. So usually like if you're going to do an hour ride before work, make sure that at its full intensity, it's going to last for at least 90 minutes or more, just so that you don't have to be like charging it to the last second before you go out for your ride. And I would definitely add like, depending on where you're riding, if you know the roads and it's mostly very predictable and most of the road surfaces are totally um, ones that you're familiar with and are mostly pretty good pavement, it could be fine to have something on your helmet or on your handlebar probably. But in general, I would prefer something on my helmet if I'm trying to ride entirely um, by what I can see with my light. Like if there's street lights and you can see pretty well and it's mostly just to augment that, on your handlebars is fine. But if you're mountain biking, or you're riding on like rural roads where there's no street lights, having something on your helmet that's 700 lumens or more is like, I think pretty key so that wherever you're looking is where you can see and not where your bike is facing. So if you are making like a 90 degree right hand turn, you don't get surprised because there's something in the road that you didn't see because your, your bike's facing forward and then you're turning to the right. Uh, or especially if you're on a trail and the, tight, the, the turns are very tight sometimes, like you're going up a switchback and then you just like crash on a route because you couldn't see it. Um, so like helmet lights are pretty key. And then for safety, I feel like um, over the years, like th that's been a big thing, like commuting in the East Bay on my bike and talking with customers like for years, I feel like having a bright tail light is key. Also having something that moves. So after a while, I put some reflective, like 3M reflective tape on my pedals uh, and my shoes so that just on my commute setup, there was both like a red light that was flashing but there's also some movement. So I think that your eyes tend to like gravitate towards things that are moving. So something that's moving up and down kind of um, cyclically, I think stands out to drivers in a way that probably makes you a little bit more safe. And like, that's just like a cheap, like two or $3 thing that you can buy at Ace or 
some hardware store that probably makes you a little bit safer than having just like a $40 bright taillight. Um, and I've had, what, my, uh, I've had my light uh, run out on me in the morning too, where uh, it's usually um, the day, the days before daylight savings time when the switch. And so I get out and do my morning ride and I end up with almost two hours in the dark and at full capacity, there's not that many lights that will last that long. So it's towards the tail end where like the light starts flashing and I know I'm out of battery. I've actually had to take a, a moment and wait uh, a couple more minutes for the sun to come up. So there's just enough ride, uh, enough for, just enough light that I could, uh, I could make it the rest of the way home off of my, off of my ride. So yeah, yeah. Like having to make sure you have a full charge is really important. You can bring spare batteries. Some of the uh, new lights, like some of the cat eye and stuff, you can actually get a battery design for that light and bring it on for guys. I know that do crazy, like 24 hour ultra riding. They'll bring like multiple um, batteries along with them so they can ride through the night. Yeah. I remember the, like I would have small commute style lights early on, but somewhere like a few years into my racing, I decided after doing the Cascade Classic, I wanted to do a 24 hour mountain bike race. That was just like, I forget. I think it was like a week or two after that. So I was in really good shape and I just took like a couple of weeks easy. But for that, I got a like a, a pretty high capacity light that was made for that kind of a thing so i had it set so i would have like a lower and higher setting so i would be like higher on descents and lower light on climbs when i was going slower but it had like a large battery that i would put in my rear pocket and could go all night potentially like a whole like 10 or 12 hours if i needed to so i feel like for people that are doing like two hour or longer commutes or training rides get something that has like they, they make lights that you can have like 500 600 a thousand lumens and have it go for hours um but it just is going to be like a little bit heavier and you're probably gonna have a battery pack that's like in your backpack or in your back pocket but that's so worth it especially if you're trying to get good training in and you don't want to just ride the trainer for three hours after work but you want to get in that kind of volume um i've, I've definitely done that i've gone for rides like starting out at dusk and finishing like <laughs> three hours into the night in the winter time um it's not usually my preference, but it's, it's fun. It's, it's, it's really cool going through like Canyon and stuff and seeing how many bats are around that you like, don't even know. Like you, I never even knew that there were so many bats, uh, just going around in the daytime until I did night rides through, um, Canyon and Pinehurst at night. Um, it's kind of fun. It's a whole new experience riding at night. Like the same roads feel, uh, exciting and new. <laughs> well, that's good. So, so to summarize, uh, stay warm, make sure you got all the right equipment if you want to brave nate's uh snorkeling gear uh system you can do that over your your bike shorts i recommend uh, a variety of gloves for different types of weather they kind of have a system that you can pull over your fingers is really great for uh cold descending make sure you got great lights tail lights headlights headlight on your uh helmet is always always good uh any other uh tips to summarize here nate before we sign off I don't know. I mean, just have good layers. Soft shell jackets are great. So you can cut through the wind and limit water intake. Um, and then obviously, I don't know, just find what works for you through trial and error to a certain extent. But I think um, what we described is pretty good. And I'll probably put down some links in the description for like your radar Garmin <laughs> and some, some possible light suggestions. I mean, um, I don't, I don't have any like affiliate links or sponsored anything for that, but I feel like just working at a bike shop for years, I just really like helping people get like equipment that is essential to them having a good experience riding. So I'll, I'll do a little bit of looking and have, add some links below so people can maybe have some like quick uh, takeaways for some core stuff that they could find. Um, but yeah, I don't know, just layer up, get stuff that's comfortable. If it's totally miserable, definitely consider getting a good trainer set up. Um, especially if you live in Colorado or don't, you can't go riding during the daylight hours and you just want to get some riding in after work. Um, we can go over that in another video, like our, our trainer setups. Exactly. Well, Hey, uh, if you like this content, uh, hit the like button and subscribe to the channel and we'll be back with more winter training tips next week. Take care. Sounds good. Bye. Bye-bye.